Now, I want to invite our church to appropriately appreciate by putting your hands together for our part finders right now. If you've enjoyed what they've done today, I would like for you to thank you. Thank you because the future of Sierra Vista depends on this. Um, when they are 15, all the way up in their young adulthood, it is likely that you will not see them again. Um, but that will not happen because here in Sierra Vista, we love our pathfinders. Amen. <laughs> Hear that, Sister Collins. They love their pathfinders. Um, I can say this because I pastored in a couple of places. And uh, my wife and I, we started out with, with adventurers. So happens she's the adventurer leader right now, director. Um, and uh, we have seen what this ministry, pathfindering, can do to our youth. And um, we can reflect now and look at the number of youth who participated and those who stayed in the church. And those who did not participate and those who are no longer uh, in the church. It's very important uh, this ministry here, and I'm excited to be a part of it. I want to thank you for your hospitality today. I'm loving this Sierra Vista hospitality. I, I must tell you, I uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Pastor Chanel, for um, having uh, my family and I here and for allowing uh, your Pathfinder Director team for um, letting them bring uh, an unusual voice to you. Amen. Amen. Um, Pastor Chanel did not uh, give me a mandate. Um, in fact, he didn't tell me how long to preach, um, which I find very strange. That, that means I have all day with you. <laughs> nah. Um, but so it, it's, it's an honor to be here in the hummingbird capital of the United States. See, you've got some birders down here. Mm-hmm. And, and to be in the place where they had the first McDonald's drive through mm. yeah, I, 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 I've been looking at it. I've been doing some research. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm in town. I got to know a little something about the town. Um, so it's an honor to be with you um, today. Uh, indeed, it is a pleasure, um, Podfinders, to be a part of this. Um, to be blessed by your ministry. And I just want to talk to you. I did ask you how long you wanted me um, to preach um, uh, today. And, and someone said, I said, do you want a long sermon or a short sermon? And someone said, a short one. Uh, and some people didn't know what to say. So I'm going to keep it short. How about that? Amen. Just because I am with you today. But now I know what it is. I've been a youth pastor for a number of years um, before uh, leading uh, my own uh, ministry and, and church. So I'm going to jump into this right here and um, share with you uh, from a familiar story. A familiar story. And then we are going to move from there. So thank you again to our friends here today. Somebody here ready for a word? Yes. Three people ready for a word. Yes. <laughs> Lord help me. We're going to go to the word of God right now. Luke chapter 5. What book did I say? Luke chapter 5. And I'm going to wait for you, um, Podfinders. I don't see you with the, the word um, right now. Um, but I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a ask that you grab your word, Podfinders, because this is, this is um, uniquely important that um, you go to the New Testament. What book did I say? <laughs> Excellent. And you're in the New Testament. Amen. Matthew, Mark, and we are at Dr. Luke. Amen. 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 
Yes, not the hymnal, the Bible. Amen. Yes, yes. I'm going to work on Aaliyah here a little bit. Amen. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Aaliyah. That's why I was learning all your names today. So I could call you by your name. Amen, Hannah. It's the New Testament. Amen. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke chapter 5. Yes, when you leave this place and they ask you what you learned, I, wanna, I want you to be able to say, well, we, we came from Luke today. Amen. Luke chapter 5. And um, I want to start at number 17, verse number 17. And I want to read a couple of these verses um, today. The Bible says at verse 17, one of those days in this version, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come from every village and town of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the Bible says, and the power of the Lord was with him. It was present with them to heal them. And behold, some men were bringing on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. And they tried. The Bible said they did what, church? They tried to carry him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him with his stretcher through the tiles into the midst in front of Jesus. And when he saw, Jesus saw, their confidence in him springing from their faith. When he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. I want to spend some time on the subject, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Look at someone next to you in the church today and say, whatever it takes. This is my word. And I'm going to receive it. Whatever it takes. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father and our God, today you have a word for us. This is our word. May your name be lifted on high. May you receive the glory you deserve. For you deserve it. Have your way in this place. Keep our minds and our hearts stayed on thee. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There are some goals in life. There are some projects, some plans, some dreams that, that come with a cost. Um, that if, um, if we don't have full commitment and if we are not totally uh, uh, on board, if we don't have buy-in, committed to the process, they will not come to fruition. There are some plans, spot finders. There are some degrees. There, 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 there are some goals in life that if you're not fully committed, you will not see the fruit, Aaliyah, of what you put in. I want to talk about, um, for example, Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore was just an idea. It came into somebody's mind. And that person decided that whatever it takes, they would make it into a reality. That the idea, the vision would become a reality. Whatever it takes, whether it was human capital, whether it was finances, whether it was sweat and tears, they would make Mount Rushmore happen. And my brothers and sisters today, what I'm trying to convey or to communicate to you is that if we're going to get anything done, 
if we're going to keep our Pathfinder Club here in Sierra Vista, if it's going to continue and have longevity and it's going to continue to exist, we have to use whatever it takes to give the club all the support it needs. I'm trying to let you know that the question is really whatever we put our time in, whatever we are investing in, whatever we have going on in our lives, we, the, the real deal is whether or not at the end of the day that will it bring glory to God. See, all, what I'm trying to tell you is that's really what matters here today. Um, it's important for us to understand that whatever we put our time in, that it will bring glory to God. These men carrying their stretchered friend would stop at nothing to get to Jesus. The Bible says they tried to get to the healer, but they found no way. Have you ever pursued a dream? Have you ever pursued a project? Have you ever tried your best to get somewhere? Have you ever done something and failed? Yeah, a few people here to confess today. Have you done a quiz or a test and you have failed? Okay, I, I'm, I'm not connecting right now. Have you tried a diet and failed? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Some of us are going to make some New Year's resolutions and fail. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. A and they tried and failed, but I wanted to let you know today that they had something more than their will driving them. They loved their friend. And I want you to know that you, you, the, the, the thing about us pursuing our dreams, it can't just be that we want to be powerful. It can't just be that we want to be rich and have money and status and authority. It can't just be that. It has to be much more. They were not about to confuse a single failure with final defeat. No no Pharisee, no teacher of the law, no spectator, no one in the crowd would stop them from getting to Jesus. Pathfinders, I wanted to tell you something. You know, a lot of our churches have a problem. A problem that plagues a lot of churches. And I want to talk to you now about it so that as you grow and get older, um, that you may not fall into this habit or fall into a spirit of fear. I have two quotations from one of my favorite books, Christ's Object Lessons, and I wanted to share that with you today. The first one is Christ's Object Lesson, uh, page 360. It says here, many Christians, how many Christians? Yeah, 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 you can talk to me. Many Christians are waiting for some great work to be brought to them because they cannot find a place large enough to satisfy their ambition. They fail to perform faithfully. Check this out, Pathfinders. Faithfully, the common duties of life. See, what this is saying to us is we don't need to manufacture any excuses today. No, we, 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 we don't need to manufacture our reasons why we can't do what we need to do for Jesus. Some people say, well, I'm too old. I'm retired. I'm just going to sit on the fence now. Some people say, I'm too young. Nobody's going to listen to me. They're not going to listen because I'm too young. Some say I'm too busy. I'm too engaged. I got no time. I know this because this usually happens right around nominating time. <laughs> Trying to find people to say yes to offices in the church and, and, and people telling me no. Will you serve? No. Will you? No. I don't know. I need to pray about it. Saints, spot finders, we want to stay close to Jesus. So much close that we are motivated by our love. That instead of us rusting out, we would wear out for Jesus. 
See, I wanted you to know that disciples run the church. Who run the church? Pathfinders. Who run the church? Pathfinders run the church. Disciples are the ones that run the church, rally a church. Disciples are fully committed to the church and involved in the work of Jesus. Disciples lead people to Jesus. Disciples not only lead people to Jesus, but disciple them. And I'm saying we must stop at nothing to rid ourselves of lethargy and, and indifference in the church. We have to get to a place where we love Jesus so much that it hurts us to see folk dying without Jesus. The thing I wanted to let you know is that they would stop at nothing to, 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 to get to Jesus. The thing is, God wants, watch this, more disciples, but we want to give him more spectators. And discipleship is not a spectator sport. And that's why, can I meddle a little bit down here? Since I, it's my first time, but you know, I'm going to leave after this, amen? You might not have me back. But that's why in the church we have more people who are members. Members on Sabbath, but no disciples at prayer meetings. That's why we have names on the church roll. They look a lot. But that's where it ends. Jesus, pathfinders, want some disciples in the church. See, it's easy to be a spectator. You know, this morning when we were coming out of the hotel, we recognized that the United States, they were playing a certain team. I think it was um, Cameroon. And, and they were spectators in the lobby and, and they were cheering, but they were losing and they were, had comments and criticism about those who were playing. Spectators. It's easy to be a spectator watching a game, but to be in the game, to feel the being overwhelmed in the game, to feel the stress of the game, to be sweating and perspiring in the game. Now that's different. That's different. And Jesus wants from us, he wants to, us to be disciples. Jesus, you see, understands the fickle, how fickle it is, um, uh, this thing about being fans and being followers. Um, he understands what it is. See, it's easy it's easy to be a fan. It's easy to be a spectator. But I'm saying to you, Pathfinders, don't get into the hype. Don't buy into the hype, the popularity of the thing. I need you to understand something today. Don't get too carried away with the popularity thing. Here's why. See, I remember, you might not remember, but I remember when High Five came out. See, you don't even know. You look at me, it's not registering. They don't even know what High Five is. You see, see, sister in the back know what high five is. It was very popular back in the day. That's like homeboy high fiving somebody right there. That's like way back when ancient times, right? But then, but then, then we had we had another one called MySpace, and everybody thought that was the thing. MySpace. If you weren't on MySpace, you nobody. Got to get on MySpace. But then after MySpace, then there was Facebook. People are like, well, Facebook not gonna last. But now we've got Instagram. And I see the young people, our youth, they just migrating. All the old folk are on Facebook now. There are young people on Facebook now. All the old folk are on Instagram. That's what I thought. Till I found out they're on TikTok now. <laughs> Don't buy into the popularity thing. It's going to wear off. See, Jesus understands this. He understands the crowd around him. Stay with me. He understands what it means to say, praise you, Jesus. He says, hail, king. He knows what that is. And he also knows 
how quick it is to shift that the same voices that say they love you are the same will say crucify him. And that is why we need in our churches more people to be disciples. Disciples exercise their spiritual gifts. Yes, disciples sacrifice in and for the church. We need more than people in the pews, Pathfinders. More than fans of the building. See, you can't just be a Pathfinder because you love Sister Collins. It's cool to love her. It's okay. She's lovable, isn't she? I notice the Pathfinders are very quiet. But we don't show up to Pathfinder meeting because we love her. But we love the Jesus in her. We don't show up to church because we just love Pastor Chanel and his, pre uh, his preach preaching. We don't just show up because of that. We show up because of Jesus. Because the Jesus in you and the Jesus in your family and the Jesus in your marriages and the Jesus in the Pathfinder will draw all men and women, boys and girls to Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because when Jesus is in the house, Jesus is in the family, Jesus is in the home, then communities are blessed. When Jesus is in the house, you can't fool him with your fluff or your fake. When Jesus is in the house, he peels back the onion, peels back our layers. See, we can hide from the elder, we can hide from the part finder director, but we cannot hide from Jesus. When Jesus is in the house, he sees beyond the cover, the mask that we wear. He knows who is hurting up in here today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is not so much in the spectators, likes, followers, and fans. He's not even necessarily uh, impressed by the row of honors on your chest. It would all burn up. What Jesus is about is have you made that commitment to him, whatever it takes. Jesus doesn't care if you're in the church 10, 15, 20, 30 years. The benches have been here, chairs have been here longer than that. Jesus is more concerned about what have you, you done for him lately? What did you do this week? See, God knows us. God does what? God knows you. He knows you down to the very electron in your body. God knows us uh, to the very count of our hair on our head. God knows us. The Holy Spirit has a special information about all of us. He knows us down to the very fabric of our being part finders. And he knows we could do more. Is that my timer? <laughs> See, I wanted you to have one last quotation from this little book, Christ Object Lessons. If you haven't read it, you, it would be great. <clears throat> Christ Object Lessons, page 313. You ready for it? If you're ready, say amen, church. Let me talk to my part finders. If you ready, say amen. amen. Yeah, they whispering up here. This is the genuine evidence of conversion. Whatever our profession, it amounts to nothing unless Jesus is revealed in our works of righteousness. You want the page again? Christ Subject Lesson, page 
our finders. If you are a tree, you must bear fruit. And if you're an apple tree, well, you can't be a peach. So God has placed within you special gifts. And you're like, no, pastor, I don't know my gift. Let me give you two already. You've got time and you have opportunity. Two gifts. And then you have your talents. Look at that. God has blessed you with so much already. And he's going to continue to bless what you have already committed to. That's why if you have two, you will have four. But if you bury your talent, you will have nothing. What I'm trying to say is, we have to be more than just talk. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are professionals at meetings. We love committees. Board meetings, ooh-wee. My first board meeting, can I confess? I'm not being recorded, amen? And you won't tell nobody, right? My first board meeting, four hours! They love meetings. Dialogue, discussion. Pathfinders talk is cheap. You can tell me you love me all you want. But if I don't see a little chocolate, come on, church. <laughs> if I don't see a little rose sometime, can we talk? Mere talk would not get this paralyzed man before Jesus. In fact, I want to suggest to you that they didn't preach a sermon. They did not uh, uh, teach Sabbath school. They, they, the, the text didn't say what position they held in church. They didn't wait for an elder. The Bible doesn't even tell us their names, their offices in the church. They didn't wait for board approval. Read it in the Bible. What the Bible says, they were action words. They were bringing, they went up, they lowered. What matters, pathfinders, it's not so much the authority and office and everything else. The, the bottom line is, are we doing it God's way? And do we know the difference? So these four brothers didn't wait on the church, you know. Uh, let's have prayer of no. To use our spiritual gifts, they just ministered. They were willing to do whatever it takes to get him to Jesus. And so I want to leave you a couple of nuggets before I go. So that when your mother asks you what you learned, you're going to tell her three things. You ready? No. I'm going to give it to you anyway. Here it is. They tried three things. Number one, they tried something difficult. They tried something different. And they tried something, you know, you got to keep the Ds. They tried something dynamic. Number one, they tried something difficult. You are going to meet some difficult challenges in life. And you might fail. But if you try again and fail again, fail better next time. There's no shame in failing. I was always made to feel that way. But if you never try, you'll never know. And failure is only a skill to let you know you're going to learn something new. Amen. They tried something difficult. It wasn't easy to carry that brother. 
carry him up on the roof. It wasn't easy. It was a difficult task. God wants us to use our gift in spite of the circumstances. All our talents, whether they are original, whether they are spiritual, all our talents, whether they are acquired or natural, use them to the glory of God. Are you hearing me today? That's the basic purpose of our spiritual gifts. The Bible says, Jesus saw their faith. Amen. If you never tried, how would Jesus see your faith? They tried something difficult. And when you've got faith in your heart, it tends to work itself out to the outside. And a faith, watch this, a faith that won't put you to work is a faith that will not take you to heaven. They tried something difficult. They tried something different, didn't they? They tried something different. They tried the front door. It couldn't work. There was a crowd, but they tried. They failed. They looked for a window, but you know, those houses back them times didn't have a lot of windows, security issues. And they were concerned about the homeowners association. If they try to make a hole in the wall, I guess the roof was, you know, a little different. So they tried, we have no door, we're going to make a door. So they went to the roof. We're going to try something different. Not only that, <clears throat> you're going to hear people tell you you can't do certain things. They're going to tell you too young. Still ask them to pray. They're going to tell you don't have no experience. Still ask for a shot. Because you're a lover of Jesus. They tried something difficult. They tried something different. And they took him on the roof and they ripped up the roof. But not only that, they tried something dynamic. No one has ever ripped up the roof before. They never tried that before. They ripped up the tile that's made of clay. And they were committed. They were dedicated. Nothing would stop them. They came prepared. They got a hole in the roof. They had to get to Jesus. Have you ever wanted something so bad you can taste it? Uh, maybe not. Have you ever smelt something and you wanted it so bad? How about a nice sweet potato pie? My mother loves to bake. Whenever she does that baking and you smell that in the oven, you can taste it already. They could taste the blessing of Jesus. They couldn't see him yet, but they were committed because they know if we just get our friend to Jesus, something awesome is going to happen. And they did. Was it risky? It was risky. Was it dangerous? Might have been dangerous. But for a soul, dear friend, to meet Jesus... The cost was worth it. The end would justify the means. And so they did something difficult. They did something different. But they did something dynamic. And this man's life was changed forever. Not only was he healed physically. But he was healed spiritually through and through. Jesus says your sins are forgiven. In that moment he was healed not just physically, but spiritually. On that day, he could say, I'm saved. And they did that for Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't think they get that. Someone did that for you. Let me tell you this. See, that's why Jesus... When they whipped him, when they nailed him, he says, whatever it takes. 
When they spit on him, he says, whatever it takes. When they jailed him, when they ripped his back raw, as blood was dripping down, Jesus was whispering, whatever it takes. And when they nailed him to the wood, whatever it takes. And he finally, with his last breath, said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He saved someone even before he died. Whatever it takes. Why? So that a part finder here today would know that whatever it takes, Jesus says, I will do whatever it takes, even my life. Some people would probably give you a kidney. Jesus says, I give you my life Amen. so that you could be saved. Whatever it takes. He's willing and he's still here. The Bible says the power of the Lord was present with Jesus. I want to suggest it's still present here today. It's still present to heal. It's still present to save. It's still present to break every chain of addiction. It's still present, Hannah, to save us. It's still present to transform us. It's still present to break up what's happening in our homes. It's still present to make prayers answered according to his will. God's power, the Bible says, is still present in his church. Shall we pray? God and our Father, we thank you for your word today. Now, Father, this was worship, not service. So we pray as we depart, never from your presence, that we have been empowered today for service. Pour your spirit upon us, we plead yet again. Set our hearts on fire. We ask this. Anoint us afresh, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.